Thank you, Erke, and it's great to be here, and I'm sorry I missed the, uh, the, the, the rest of the program, so forgive me if I repeat what some other people said. And I certainly, uh, so I've been asked to address three topics. One is the effects of transparency on the deliberative process. A second one is transparency and the fiscal effects, fiscal risks that Erke was just talking about. And the third is transparency, communications, and the support for independence, building trust in the institution. And I'm going to do this primarily from a US perspective. That's my 40 years of experience, and that's what I feel comfortable talking about. I'll bring in some other things from time to time, but basically this is about the US experience. So I certainly start from the same premise that Erke said was the consensus earlier today, that is, more transparency and communication is generally better in terms of promoting accountability and policy effectiveness. But it needs to be the right kind of transparency and communication. It needs to promote an understanding of what the central bank has done, why it's done it, and what it's likely to do in the future. It needs to reflect the underlying uncertainty in the economy and in po and monetary policy making. I think it's, there are a number of challenges here in addition to the underlying uncertainty. And one challenge, which I'm, I'm guessing was discussed earlier today, but hopefully again in this panel, is how much weight to put on individuals and individual policymakers and their views and how much weight to put on the center of gravity of the committee, the consensus of the committee. And I think it's very hard to get that right. There are potential costs to uh, too much transparency. One is giving the wrong impression about what, or the wrong kind of transparency about what actually the central bank is doing and why it's doing it. And a second one is it might have an effect on the deliberative process, So, which I'll get into a second. But I think every step in transparency, every new step, needs to be subject to a cost-benefit analysis. And you don't know what the costs are going to be. You don't know what the benefits might be. But I think you've got to think about it that way. And in particular, every step we take as central banks is pretty much irreversible. It's hard to take it back once you've done it. So it's really important to think about both the costs and the benefits of taking an additional step in transparency. Let's talk about the deliberative, policy, the deliberative process. The first job of monetary policy is to get policy right, right? So to the committee must get it right, they must meet their objectives. That's what you were formed for. The objectives were given to you by the legislature or the treaty as the case might be. So that's your first job. I think the odds on getting it right are increased when there is full and open discussion in the policy committee with a free flow of ideas where alternatives are considered and mechanisms are, in, are embraced to find consensus or uh, allow, allow the sense, but to work through those alternative perspectives and alternative views, have an exchange of views. And I think being open and transparent as possible about that process, about the deliberate process, the exchange of views, the alternatives is very, very helpful promoting both the accountability and the policy effectiveness goals of transparency and communication. Uh, the quality of the discussion is a very important part of accountability. When central banks take actions, it may be a long time before the actions are felt. It may, other things may influence the outcomes. So one way that the people in a democracy have to judge how well a central bank is doing by is judging the quality of the discussion. Is it bringing the right things to bear? Is it having the right kind of discussion? And, and knowing that will promote confidence. It will promote support for independence, um, especially by knowing diverse views are presented and how they were worked through. Um, and it also obviously uh, promotes policy effectiveness where markets understand the reasoning process and how the central banks are making the decision. How best to do this? So I think it takes, I don't think you can really promote a lot of understanding in three minutes on CNBC or Bloomberg. 
I think that tends to, uh, there are probably people here from CNBC and Bloomberg, and I, I'm not going to apologize. That's my view. Uh, uh, I think it promotes kind of the gotcha moment and the, the very, very uh, people trying to move markets, the reporters or the people trying to move markets. I think it takes a bit of a longer form to get through a real understanding of what the what the uh, monetary policy process has done. Longer speeches, press conferences where there can be give and take. Uh, and I think most importantly, the minutes of the policy meetings are really important because minutes are a document of the committee. They should reflect the diversity of views that come to, to come into the committee and they should give how that diversity was worked through to get the answer and why the committee arrived at that answer. But it's challenging, and I think a particular challenge in minutes is the balancing of the individual views and the committee, and the committee views. And here I'm going to pick a little bit on the Federal Reserve and the ECB. So the Federal Reserve, I think, gives, um, and. The way I framed this in my own mind was forest and trees. So is there enough information to give a sense of the overall forest, how the committee reached its consensus, or is there too much information on the trees, how the individuals looked? And I, I think in both cases, they could use some thought about this, about this balance. Of course, the Federal Reserve seems to have evolved in a way in its minutes, put on a lot, of, a lot of emphasis on a few people said this, some people said that, a few more said this, several said that, and a lot of interpretation. I think when I get finished reading parts of those minutes, I think, well, I kind of understand the diverse views that came to bear, but I'm not quite sure how the decision actually came out of this thing. And having sat in, probably hundreds of FOMC meetings, I know that for the most part, yes, there are dissents and alternative views. Over time, a consensus tends to form. There is a center of gravity in the committee, and I worry sometimes that putting so much emphasis on individual views misses the center of gravity that comes out of the, comes out of the FOMC meeting. And I also wonder whether it feeds back on the deliberative, deliberative process. So if you're sitting in there and you want to make sure that the views you have are represented and the count is accurate, everybody has to comment on almost everything so that a few mean something and many mean something. And I, I, it's, this is, it's been seven or eight years since I've been in one of these meetings, but I have a sense that the minutes may contribute to the um, length of the meetings and the difficulty of coming to a consensus. I had the other reaction reading the ECB minutes, and I must admit I'm not a, I'm not a regular reader of ECB meet, uh, minutes. I consulted with the ECB staff when they went down this path, so I read the first one, and I read the ones that just came out um, for the last thing. The ECB avoids a few, many, several, by using the passive voice. So there are no actors in an ECB meeting. It's all, it was noted, peop, you know, uh, so they don't, and, and it feels to me like there's an occasional, a, a view was expressed, and even a view was reiterated. And I thought I could identify that one, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I wonder, in reading the ECB minutes, whether I'm getting enough of a sense of the diversity of views that come into the, into the decision process because there's so much emphasis on the, the consensus that comes out. So I think both, both, uh, both institutions probably need to work a little bit on getting that balance right. Uh, let me... Uh, finish the, tr the decision-making uh, process thing with uh, something about transcripts. So here's uh, an area where I think the costs exceed the benefits. Um, I think about the FOMC before 1993 and after 1993 when those transcripts started uh, to be published. There were benefits 
of publishing the trans uh, transcripts for the deliberative process. I think some people who kind of didn't really participate very much from time to time made sure they participated and made sure they were well prepared because they knew someone would be reading their words in five years. But I think the costs outweighed those benefits. There was a shift to reading statements rather than reacting to what you heard. Uh, there was much less give and take, much less testing of ideas, reacting to what others said, trying to figure out where to go. The meetings became much longer as everybody commented on everything. And I suspect it contributed a little bit to more action uh, before the meeting rather than in the meeting. So I think the transcripts have been a net negative for the deliberative process at the Federal Reserve. I know it's not, it's not reversible, but uh, I think uh, the rest of you be, would, should think very, very hard before you go down that path. Let me say a few words about the fiscal effects of monetary policy and the rebuilding trusts. So on the, in the case of fiscal risk and monetary policy, Here's one where I think more is better, more communication is better. You've got unelected un technocrats playing with the public purse. Uh, yes, all monetary policy has fiscal effects of one sort or another, just raising and lowering that interest rate. But the unconventional monetary policies where institutions um, build, uh, bought assets in a sense, uh, longer term assets financed by reserves remunerated on an overnight basis, so doing a, a, carry, a, a huge carry trade, a maturity transformation, made loans to a variety of private firms, yes, collateralized, but also made those loans, I think took the central banks into a new area of uh, fiscal, of potential fiscal effects. Um, I think there was, uh, and I was actually surprised when I left the Fed in the fall 2010, how much interest there was in this outside the Federal Reserve. So what's going to happen when interest rates turn around? What are the risks on the, on the, FOMC, on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet? How is this all going to play forward? And there was, uh, I think, in the Fed anyhow, and I partly responsible while I was in there, a, f a holding back on the discussion of fiscal risk for fear that it would undermine public support for the unconventional, unconventional programs. But it bred misunderstandings and a sense that the Fed hid, was hiding something. So it took a couple years for the Federal Reserve to, be, uh, to start publishing a staff study which really looked at this very, very carefully. So I think you need, uh, central banks need to acknowledge that there might be some fiscal risk, and I think particularly about risk. So the, the, there are mitigants to this, collateral when you're lending, et cetera. But um, the second moment of this thing, the fact that uh, profits could go up or down, the, what you re remit to the treasury could go up or, or, up or down, I think needs to be acknowledge the dispersion of outcomes as well as the expected gain or loss. Um, so uh, it will vary over the cycle. I don't, I, I, I wonder whether when central banks emphasize that they're making a lot of profits now, so you shouldn't worry about losses later, whether that's the right thing to do. So yes, you should talk about how this might vary over the cycle, but the central bank is not a profit, wasn't there to make profits. And uh, when you start playing that game, well, we may make some losses later, but we've made some profits now. It's the right thing to point out, but in a sense, you're playing on a ground that is profits and loss that re you really shouldn't be playing on. It's uh, central bank is about monetary policy and hitting legislative goals. I think you need to be very careful about that. On the rebuilding trust issue, um, just um, a minute or two on that. So here, not what, and, and protecting independence, my emphasis here is not so much on what is said, but who it's said to. So it f sounds like from Erky's introduction, there was some discussion of this this morning, reaching out beyond the traditional bubble that the central banks talk in of financial markets, some academics, 
um, the financial press, uh, a few legislators, a few CEOs. I think to build trust uh, and restore trust and to protect independence, we need to reach out as far as possible in the general public. I, there are you know, perhaps not a lot of general public that are really interested in this, but I think broader TV than Bloomberg and CNBC, so Ben Bernanke's piece on 60 Minutes was a good idea. Regional news outlets, um, I see Andy Haldane sitting out there. I've appeared in the Leeds, whatever it is, and the Newcastle, whatever, as a member of the FPC. So there's, there's a effort in the Bank of England to go out to the regions from the center and talk to the regional news outlets. And I think that's a good idea. The Fed relies on the Reserve Bank presidents to a considerable extent for this. But the Reserve Bank presidents, I think, don't always represent the center of gravity of the committee, and they don't always reach out the way they should. So I think the protecting independence, rebuilding trust, requires going over the heads of the legislators to the people they represent as much as possible. Thank you.